All right, glad to see you're back with us. This is Heath Close with Build Box, and I'd like to welcome you to part three of the Make Your Own Game series. In part two, we learned quite a bit. That was a huge video, jam-packed with a lot of good information for you. We learned about collision shapes and matching them to the graphics we dropped in during part one. We learned how to make sure they are just a bit forgiving when forming them. And we went into great detail about object settings and object components. Now, in part three, we are going to learn about world settings and how they affect your game. And we're going to take a look at character settings, which more specifically define the behavior of your character in that world. And then we are going to get into building more levels for Glitch. We'll build a level together. And then I'm going to build more levels for us in a time-lapse video for you to watch. And my goal is to have at least 10 levels done by the time this video is finished. So first, to get us started, let's talk about world settings and character settings. The great thing about using the creator in part one to get us started in this series is that creator set us up with all the world and character settings done and ready to go for us we could literally release this game and never touch a single world or character setting. It's that thorough. But if we wanted to customize the settings, let's talk about how we would do that. To find the world settings, we need to go up into the menu editor. So in the upper left, click on the menu editor button. And BuildBox takes us up into the menu editor where all our user interfaces and worlds live in the game mind map. Select the world we have been editing the scenes in to reveal the settings for that world in the options panel to the right. You can set different settings for different worlds in the same game, but we only have one in Glitch for now, so let's go through what these do. So the first setting we see in the world settings is the name of the world. And you might be thinking that is not an important setting, and you might be right, but our game as it is right now is very simple. What if our game looked like this? Naming your worlds as you create them would make it much easier to find what you are looking for in a game's mind map. Only your imagination is your limit once you learn this software, so making a game that complex is only a matter of you getting there. So name your worlds accordingly. It will be a big help to get into that good habit. The next setting is gravity. Fairly self-explanatory, gravity of course affects the weight of the objects in this world. The first box is the x-axis gravity and the second is the y-axis gravity. That setting structure should now be familiar to you after going into detail on the object settings in part two. Hey, there's a familiar graphic. So x gravity here and y gravity here. So let's set our gravity to minus 20 along the y axis and put something in our world to see how that changes things. We'll double click on our world to go to where our scenes live. Let's go to this last scene here with our spiky enemy and select the scene by clicking on it. Then we'll hit D to duplicate it and S to solo it for testing. Now let's click on our fixed enemy here and delete it and also the one with the live spawner component and delete that. Now let's drag in a platform and resize it to half scale. Let's also change the preset to be a physics object so that the world settings affect its behavior. Use W to duplicate it. And let's have a look at what our y-axis gravity does to our physics objects. Whoa, coming in hot like a ton of bricks. Let's change the y-gravity to plus 2 and have a look. See how they keep up with the character fairly well? That's because they are falling up. If we set that plus two much higher, we would never see them in the game because they would fall up faster than the speed of the game and we would never get to them. Let's put negative 0.5 in the x-axis gravity and see their behavior. 
As you can see, they are falling to the left into the negative direction of the x-axis. So gravity is fairly simple, and it doesn't take a lot to get a reaction out of things. That last setting was 0.5. Let's go ahead and reset our gravity to 0, 0, and have a look at time warp. Right now, we have it set to 50, which is a fairly good setting to start with. Our game seems to run at a fair pace for the beginner. But let's see what setting time warp to 100 does. I see a turbo mode in Glitch's future. We'll keep this in mind for down the road. This is something we will definitely revisit later. But for now, let's set that time warp back to 50 so we don't scare off the new user. The next setting is friction. Friction increases or decreases the friction between all objects. So, if there was something your character was supposed to push along a platform, say, this would be the setting to play with. Let's set that to 550 and set some of our platforms against the wall. Remember, you can use Shift to drag in a straight line and the mouse scroll button to zoom in and out. We could turn on debug mode if that makes it easier to see where the collision shapes are. And use W to duplicate a few more up the wall. Now let's see what that 550 friction setting does. See how this platform here has stopped me dead? That's the friction between the wall and the platform being too high for our little character there. So let's change that back to 50, but keep in mind that there's creative ways that you could use that friction setting. All right, so velocity drag is next. Velocity drag places a force on moving objects, causing them to slow down. So in other words, it's mud for momentum. Let's put a 3 in that setting and see what that does to our physics objects. See how their momentum is affected like they're moving through mud? Let's change that back to 0. Alright, so bounce will change the bounce force between all objects in the game. Let's put 250 in there and see how that looks. Wow, I'm literally bouncing off the walls here. Yeah, look at that. That's obviously too much. Let's change that back to zero. Score multiplier is used in distance-based scoring and allows you to increase or decrease the points earned as the character progresses through the game. I'll show you that later when we design our user interface. Game direction changes the direction the game is played in. And finally, Camera Smooth is a more advanced feature that adjusts how jittery the camera gets during certain mechanics. So best to just leave that alone for now. The Object Deletion Threshold is a setting measured in pixels. For example, once an object reaches 1000 pixels behind the game direction, it is deleted from the device's memory. So this is handy for optimizing performance on a mobile device. And then forced movement here, which is the setting that makes our game scroll or be able to stand still like a platformer. All right, that's the tour of the world settings. Now let's double click on that world and get into character settings. Okay, so you're already familiar with the animation settings as we covered those in part one. And we have sound settings here, which are drag and drop. BuildBox will accept MP3s. Just drag an MP3 into those settings. There are settings for lighting and tilting your character when it moves. And we have game over effects, which we're going to cover in another video. There are options for how this character is available to the user. And then that brings us to the gameplay settings. Max speed is just that, the maximum speed allowed for the character's movement. So if we use an action to increase our character's speed for a short time, it won't exceed what you put in here. And that first box is X and that second box is Y. Bounce force is just like the bounce setting we saw in the world settings, but it is just for the character. So if we wanted to make a game like Trey Smith's Phases, this is the setting to make that happen. Again, settings for X and Y. 
jump force would be how powerful we want our jump to be. So if we had a game like a platformer, we would use this in conjunction with gravity to get the effect we want or the jump we want to have. And again, this is for X and Y. Jump timeout is used to vary your jump, so a higher value gives the player the option to hold the jump button down longer for a bigger jump. And the jump counter is how many jumps can be executed before hitting the ground. So if you wanted to do a double jump, you would put a 2 in here. Ground threshold is a setting used to detect when the player is on the ground and able to jump. And checking or unchecking jump from ground allows the player to jump in midair. Left lean force and right lean force will lean or rotate the character when moved in that direction. And platform friction is the force that brings the character to a stop on a platform. So a low number would give you this icy slide effect on a platform. Rotation drag is just like velocity drag, but it's mud for rotation of the character. And air drag is also similar to velocity drag or rotation drag, but it's mud for your character's momentum in the air. And again, X and Y settings here. Direct movement allows moving the character around the screen by directional controls. Forced movement is a setting that moves the character with the game. And the last two here are really simple. Fixed rotation means the player will not rotate no matter what happens. And image direction means the graphic will point in the direction of movement. So a lot of options here to get your character to behave as you see fit. Now there are also components you can add to a character. Just like we added object components to our swirly death bringer in part two. But we are going to cover character components in another video. All right, so that wraps up world and character settings and gives you the info you need to customize gameplay. Speaking of gameplay, we need to make more game to play, so let's create more scenes in our game. We'll build the first one together, and then you can kick back and watch me build more until we hit 10 at least. Now let's start by removing the physics objects in scene 2. You can select them and delete them in the scene, or you can select them in the scene tree. Now, there are two ways to get items into our scene. One way is to drag them from the Assets panel into the scene. But one thing to keep in mind, when you drag from the Assets panel, you need to set up the item to behave how you want, like we did in Part 2 with our Swirly Death guy. So another way is to copy and paste items you have already set up. Remember how we copied and pasted our little bad guy and made one of them just an overlay for the spawner? Well, we can copy and paste from one scene into another scene. Let's go to our start scene and copy one of the mountain enemies and go back to scene 2 and click on the scene editor so it has focus and paste our enemy in. Notice how it pasted behind the wall. I think the game would look better if we had all the mountains in front of the wall. So let's reorder it in the scene. Remember, items at the top appear in front of items at the bottom. And so that it's easier to figure out what we are looking at in the scene tree as we design levels, let's rename our platform to Wall. Okay, let's go ahead and resize this so it's substantial in the scene. Remember when I said we were going to use negative scale? Let's flip the scale on the x-axis and note what it does. See how it flipped the image? I'd like to get all the shadows on our mountains to be underneath. So all the mountain enemies along that left wall will have to flip the x-axis on them, or we can just copy and paste from this one now. Looking at this in debug mode, we may need to adjust the collision shape later, but we'll build out the levels and just see how that goes first. Okay, so for this level we are building together, let's drag in a new enemy. I'm just going to grab the entire PNG sequence and drop it on the object option in the drag and drop wheel. And boom, new bad guy. Let's select it in the Assets panel and adjust its collision shape before we forget. See how those spikes could be one circle and the body another? 
let's split the difference for the leeway we discussed in part two. Okay, let's rotate him just a bit and set this enemy up with the enemy preset. And let's give this guy some movement, say five, across the board, all random. All right, so let's preview the selected scene to test this out. Looks like we just built our first scene for Glitch. Kick back and I'll make some more for us. First thing you're going to see and notice is that I don't think I pull anything from the assets panel. I'm doing all copy and paste. It is a much more rapid way to design your levels. You'll also notice that I do a lot of testing. I'm soloing the scene or using preview selected scene as I go so I can play them and see if what I've done works. You'll also notice a lot of changes in the layering in the mountain looking enemies because I'm trying to make sure that those shadows look appropriate with each other. Some of them look better on top and some of them look better below. So a lot of layering and seeing what works. And also keep in mind, you're not always going to get it right. So testing your game is going to be very important because some of the scenes that you've made just might not work. And also keep in mind, if you randomize your scenes in a game, one scene has to work with all the other scenes. So that's one thing to keep in mind when you're creating random levels for a game like this. All right, let's play it and see how it's turning out. Keep in mind that having random velocities on enemies doesn't always work. Sometimes you want to make sure your enemies go in a specific direction to create difficulty for your player. If your enemies are always running away from you randomly, that just is no fun. So sometimes you'll want to take those random numbers and put in very specific directions. One of the things you have to keep in mind when you play is always questioning whether it's too hard or too easy. All right, Glitch is shaping up quite nicely. Now in the next video, we're going to make our game unique. We're going to take a look at adding a new gameplay element and we'll learn about character components. So come on back for that one, and I'll see you in part four.